Welcome everyone to the Hellenic Initiative Canada New Leaders webinar event, Who Owns History? featuring prominent international barrister Jeffrey Robertson. My name is Marissa Papa-Constantino. I'm a Greek-Canadian Paralympic athlete and an ambassador for the THI Canada New Leaders. THI New Leaders are young members of the Greek diaspora who are passionate about working together, Oli Mazi, to build a better future for Greece. Today, I join you from Florida, where I'm currently training for an international training camp with Team Canada. I'm honored to be part of this event, which we will discuss the important topic of the return of the Parthenon Marbles. On behalf of the THI New Leaders, we hope you enjoy today's webinar. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hellenic Initiative New Leaders' latest edition to their speaker series, Who Owns History? The Case for the Return of the Parthenon Marbles. My name is John Sotos, and I serve as co-president of the Hellenic Initiative Canada. The Hellenic Initiative has a strong presence in Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, and Calgary, and we are soon establishing in Vancouver and uh, Halifax. When we planned this event, we couldn't have foreseen the calamity that's taking place in Ukraine uh, currently. On this, the 100th anniversary of the 1922 Smyrna catastrophe. Some may think that given the gravity of what's happening in uh, Ukraine, uh, a discussion of history and culture uh, should probably have been held off. Unfortunately, the story of the taking of the Parthenon marbles shares many elements in common with the looting of artifacts currently taking place in Ukraine. The manner in which the case of the Parthenon marbles is resolved may well provide a principal basis for dealing with the reappropriation of cultural property in the future. The Hellenic Initiative Canada New Leaders is a group of our under 40 supporters who are passionate about helping the needy uh, elderly, as well as young people in Greece. This event, in, indeed the pursuit of this initiative to restore the Parthenon marbles to their rightful place, could not have taken place without the relentless drive of my good friend, John Leffas, and the Leffas Humanitas Foundation, to whom I extend our deepest gratitude. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to present today's discussion moderator. He is the chief data officer, data scientist and founder of Nanos Research and the newest director of the Hellenic Initiative Canada's board. He is a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC. He is one of 20 honorary captains in the Royal Canadian Navy and also the past chair of Carleton University in Ottawa. Nick leads the team behind the weekly Bloomberg Nanos Canadian Confidence Index and is also featured in the weekly segment on CTV's news channel, Nanos on the Numbers, which focuses on the latest political business and social trends. Welcome, Nick. Thanks, John. And it's great to uh, join everyone. We're gonna have a really great webinar today with uh, Jeffrey Robertson, but before I pass it over to Jeffrey, let me just tell you a few things about him. He has a distinguished career as a trial and appellate counsel, an international judge, an author of leading textbooks. He's argued many landmark cases in media, constitutional and criminal law in the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, the Supreme Court, for the House of Lords and Privy Council, the UN War Crimes, it keeps going, the, the World Bank's International Center for Settlement of investment disputes and in the highest courts in many Commonwealth countries. And Jeffrey has, as a jury advocate, appeared in many criminal trials in the Old Bailey and libel trials in the High Court. And he's appeared in several hundred reported cases in the Court of Appeal and in judicial review, reviews in the High Court and subsequent appeals. And he has a large advisory practice for clients, including governments, media corporations, NGOs, and local councils. I'm going to say that this man is a Renaissance man because he's also a Rhodes Scholar, and we're not going to be talking about that today, also a, a Rhodes Scholar with uh, Oxford University. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Jeffrey Robertson, the uh, author 
of the book, Who Owns History? And then uh, after you're done, Jeffrey, we'll have a little chit chat and then we'll open it up to the group for questions. So over to you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Nick, for that overkind introduction. It's a pleasure to talk today about the Parthenon and its marbles. The 600 foot frieze that ran around the inside of the building and the sculptures that were bolted to its walls. It's a wonder of the ancient world, the only wonder perhaps of that world that survives today, albeit bifurcated and despoiled by Lord Elgin. And it remains, however, uh, superb and unique in our civilization and what we possess of the cultural heritage of the past. When uh, UNESCO was listing it as a World Heritage Site, it said that those, the frieze and the sculptures are universal symbols of the classical spirit and civilization and form the greatest architectural and artistic complex bequeathed by Greek antiquity to the world. Even the British Museum says the marbles rank above the highest achievements of mankind, not only for their aesthetic qualities, but also for their central place in the cultural history of ancient nations. And I would add, yeah, as they <laughs> should have, that uh, it ranks in the highest place of the current civilization of liberal democracy of the desire for peace. Well, the Acropolis in 450 BC was an extraordinary place. The theaters on the hill had shows by Aeschylus and Sophocles, Euripides, Aristophanes. In the foothills, Pythagoras was pondering his theorems and Herodotus was writing something called history. And working on the temple was a stonemason called Socrates. That was the glory of Greece in 400 and 50, and it comes down to us most movingly, I think, in the freeze. It is something that, as I walk around it, uh, uh, it strikes me like some 2,500 year old black and white movie, as if we actually could see through the genius of the sculptor Phidias, the uh, procession in ancient Athens with people walking and talking and drinking, I'm glad to say, as they walked up the hill to the monument and to the frieze and to look at the uh, wonderful reflection of what life was like in this first peaceful democracy. It was the brainchild, of course, of Pericles, built to glory of, of Athena, but also to reflect on the triumphs of Marathon and Salamis, which were necessary to secure peace, and to the form of government that Pericles immortally called. Well, he said this, we are called a democracy for the administration is in the hands of the many, not the few, and with equal justice to all. Well, it celebrated a city that had attained wealth, the Delian League, it had uh, by tributes from other cities and islands, and it had attained that degree of civic advancement that was celebrated in its annual procession. And uh, it was designed, I think this is important to understand, it was designed by uh, its architects 
as a unity. The sculptures, the frieze, the uh, pillars, the Doric pillars are all integral to the vision of Pericles and Phidias. I have a quote I will read you. I think it sums up the absurdity of the present situation by Professor Connell. How come half of it is in North London in some gloomy gallery dedicated to an wholly objectionable art fraudsman and the other half is in the museum below the, 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 the Acropolis you know, on the foothills of the Acropolis. Well, this is what she said. The sculptures derive their original and essential meaning from their immediate context of one another, the sanctuary they share and the city for which they were created. Apart from one another, they're merely relics, however finely wrought. The wholeness of the Parthenon demands our respect and warrants our every effort to reunify it such as we can. Let us for a moment consider the state of the central figures of the West Pediment. Poseidon's shoulders are held in London while his pectoral and abdominal mass muscles remain in Athens. Athen Athena's battered head, neck and right arm are displayed in the new Acropolis Museum, while her right breast remains in the British Museum. This deliberate and sustained dismemberment of what of some of the most sublime images ever carved by humankind brings shame on those who work to uphold this state of affairs. Those who work to uphold this state of affairs, of course, are the current British government and the current trustees of the British Museum. Well, how did it ever come to this? The Parthenon survived in pretty much intact for 2,300 years. The ravage, it survived the ravages of the Goths, the ravages of Christianity. And uh, when it was occupied by the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, in 1458, it was shown as a religious monument, very great respect. The French at a time Napoleon was riding high, offered to buy some of the sculptures. No way, they said the Ottomans in 1780, just 20 years before Elgin. No way, we, we are an occupying power, law requires us to respect uh, cultural heritage, temples and the like. The only damage that it suffered, and it was a lot of damage, was from the Venetians who had invaded and uh, the Turks rather irresponsibly had stored their munitions in the Parthenon and they blew up. And uh, some of the columns were, uh, fell down, uh, some of the statues were hit the ground and shattered into pieces. And, so the Parthenon in 1980, in 1780 and 1800 had, was half there or three quarters there, as you can see today from the pillars, but the ground was strewn with rubble, the pentalic marble of uh, the smashed statues and the columns uh, littered the ground. It, it really was. Uh, a rubble. But what was important was that the Turks and the Ottomans guarded the site. There were two governors at the time. There was a civil governor and there was a military governor, governor. And they decided who should enter and what they should do. And there was undoubtedly a a bit of bribery and corruption, people came and 
picked up pieces of statues from the ground. But when a British MP tried to pocket a piece of marble in 1795, he was told, no way, we are protecting this temple. Well, come 1801, Lord Elgin, he was a Scottish Lord. He always aspired to be an English Lord, but he was merely a Scottish Lord, was told that he, by his architect, that he could perhaps make his dream of becoming an English Lord if he turned his home in Scotland into a kind of museum of Greek art, because that would inspire uh, British emulators. So when he was made the British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, which was in Constantinople, now Istanbul, he hired many workmen to draw and to mold the uh, figures on the Parthenon. This was purely an exercise in molding replicates so that he could take home and show off uh, the, rep the, the famous Parthenon gods and the frieze to people uh, in Britain. But what happened was that he, as British ambassador, riding high on Nelson's triumph over the French in Egypt, which made Britain very popular at the time, he, uh, he found that his party, which was led by his own private chaplain, the Reverend Hunt, who was the real villain of this story, was not being allowed onto the Parthenon to make their molds and do their drawings. So he arranged for a high figure in the, at the port, the Turkish, uh, the, the Ottoman uh, Empire, to give him a letter to the military go to, and civil governors saying that Lord Elgin's workmen should be allowed entrance and they should be allowed to uh, mold and to draw and to pick up pieces of stones from the ground. Now, this letter, we have it in an Italian translation, was quite clearly limited to picking up pieces of the marble that were strewn among the rubble. It did not, it went, it said expressly, there must be no harm to the building. Well, armed with this letter, which was delivered uh, by a fellow we'll talk about later called Aga, a uh, junior official in the port to the civil governor, along with Reverend Hunt, uh, the, it quite clearly required the civil governor to give this uh, modicum of help to the British ambassador's workmen. Well, with the help of massive bribes, not only money, but we've got a list of them. There were dual, dual handled pistols. There were horses. There were um, telescopes. There were tailors from Savile Row, the best British suits, and so forth. Uh, the governors were bribed to turn a blind eye. And in went the workmen, and they ripped off the walls, ripped off the walls, these wonderful statues and a large half of the frieze that was running around it was the uh, quite, <laughs> I've described as the newsreel of the procession uh, all those years ago. And well, they cut their, they, they backs of the statues had been carefully um, carved. They cut them off and they, a lot of them were damaged, 
as they were ripped down, and they took them off to hide them in the garden of the British consul, who uh, was there to help tourists. And then they smuggled them aboard, no provision, no notice of any sort, to British warships. So this really was uh, a British enterprise and delivered them to Elgin at the Foreign Office. And they, uh, some a couple of occasions, he used his own ships that he'd hired or chartered. He was a wealthy man, thanks to uh, a, having a very wealthy wife. And uh, so he could well afford it. And uh, did he ever pay for them? Of course not. He didn't suggest paying because he knew from 1780 that he'd be rejected. Of course, the Ottoman Empire would not allow him to despoil a temple. Did he offer any money to the locals? No, he didn't. Of course, he stole those statues and that uh, marble, wonderful marble, colored at the time, frieze, and took them off secretly to London. So there is no doubt that he was a thief, and he had no, in order to despoil a temple, an occupying power had to uh, have it on the highest authority. He needed what was called a firman, which is a license from the Sultan. Now, he didn't have one. All he had was a letter, and all, not from the Sultan, but from a high official, and all he, uh, and that, all that letter enabled him to do was to mold and to draw and to pick up pieces of sculpture that had fallen smashed to the ground. Instead, he took the whole, the best of the marbles that he could find. And uh, that was his objective. He knew that he had no right to do it. And we can see that from his letters expressing the joy that his devious padre had uh, managed to bribe the Ottoman governors in order to uh, take, turn a blind eye to uh, their pulling these wonderful statues off the walls. So that is clear from history. Various Turkish historians have gone through every firman issued by the Sultan, a very official document, uh, at the time, and there is no firm for the collection of the marbles. All we have is an Italian translation, this uh, letter from the, uh, from, from the official that was a friend of Elgin's too. So how on earth did this come about that the British Museum and the British government can claim, as they have consistently done, that this was, that Elgin acquired the marbles legally. Well, he didn't. And uh, that's really historically the end of the story. But he, uh, the first claim that was made, and there was a select committee inquiring into this in 1816, a parliamentary committee, was that he had ferment. He had a ferment. He couldn't produce it. His evidence to the select committee when he wanted to sell the marbles, he became very poor and he was uh, anxious to recover the money that he'd paid on, acquired, on, on obtaining them but uh, he had no proof, the committee couldn't believe it, he just had no proof that he was the legitimate owner. Uh, he got his, his uh, prelate, Reverend Hunt, came along 
and produced this document, which quite plainly didn't go far enough and wasn't the Berman. So that claim was frankly dishonest and has been blown out of the water by historians. Now, of course, when he tried to sell the marbles to the British government, there was an inquiry, but he had to come up with a cover story. And so his cover story, which he published in a little book and was uh, repeated to the select committee, was that he'd gone to Athens in 1801 and the despoliation began in the middle of that year, and that he'd talked to Turkish soldiers who told him that they were shooting at the sculptures and uh, using them for target practice, and that uh, he claimed that he had seen people uh, trying to rip off uh, other sculptures off the wall. So he saved them. This was this still is the story the British Museum tells, Elgin as savior. No Elgin, no marbles. We wouldn't have got them apart were it not for this uh, courageous British, Scottish aristocrat, which of course is also nonsense. And you know why? Because I discovered, but I think other historians also, he didn't go to Athens until the middle of 1802. He stayed in Constantinople, which was 14 days from uh, Athens on, on the travel in those times. And so he could not have had this motive to rescue the marbles, talk to the uh, Turkish soldiers and so forth. This was all a lie. It was made up as a cover story to explain his so-called good motivation. Well, the British politicians, the MPs, were not convinced. They never found that he had acquired them legally. But it was a fait accompli because they had these marvelous uh, sculptures which people had started to marvel ab uh, ab about, Keats and so forth, saw them and wrote poetry and Shelley as well. And uh, so they were anxious to inquire, to, to obtain them. They never consulted anyone from the Ottoman Empire or from Greece, of course. And what they decided, and, and indeed Elgin was quite loathed. The speeches in Parliament all attacked him. They attacked him because as British ambassador, he had used his office for personal profit. That was seen as a very bad example. And they realized that he never had the, any legal title. So what they did, typical British compromise, and they said, well, we might as well keep them because they're so valuable. But he's asking 75,000 for them, which is about 9 million pounds in today's money, uh, which were the costs of bringing them. Uh, they said, we'll give him only 35,000. So he doesn't make a profit. And uh, a profit he didn't make, he was very upset, the money was paid to him and was intercepted by his creditors. So he didn't actually uh, make any money out of it. But uh, that was the compromise that the British Parliament um, made at the time. And what about his lack of title? His lack of any legal title? Well. They solved that by passing a law in 1816 that deemed the marbles the property of the British uh, Museum. So if you don't have the right, he could simply, if he, if he was 
uh, the legitimate owner, he could simply have donated them to the British Museum, even for a large sum of money. He could have, they could have purchased them in Norway. No, uh, there was such a gap in his title that they had to pass a special statute to deem uh, the British Museum in possession. Well, the British Museum has held them ever since. 200 years, and they now claim, would you believe, that the marbles have been what they call elganized. In other words, they've been in Britain so long that we'll give them nationality. They're part of us. So uh, the British Museum has made different claims at different times. They've changed their story uh, in uh, quite a number of ways. For a while, they put on the outside of this gallery, the Duveen Gallery. Duveen was a dreadful art forger who wanted to give, make himself a lord, so he did that in traditional way by donating uh, a lot of money uh, to politicians, and uh, he donated a gallery to the British Museum for the display of the marbles. But he was a bit of a nutcase. He decided that they looked better white. I mean, originally they had been colored and they were in a, a, an authentic brown state when they were first exhibited. No, he wanted them white. So he had them scowled and chiseled and painted. And so they appear today quite differently to how they appeared in Lord Elgin's time. But there it is, there's so much for the custody taken of them, good care, the British Museum says, and it uh, is unkeen to mention this uh, dreadful period in which the owner who had donated the gallery was entitled to uh, really to deform them. And so then we have this, this lie, uh, Mr. Argo appeared whenever uh, historians would debunk the story they tell on the front of the gallery and display. Uh, historians prove it's false, and so they change it. After my book was published a couple of years ago, showing that their story was false, they invented someone called Mr. Arga, this fellow uh, who had uh, brought the letter to the civil governor. And they said he was the senior official and he gave Elgin, Elgin uh, authority to remove the marble. This was a complete fiction. It was, uh, uh, and there it was on the walls of the British Museum until then later, uh, I, my book, I showed that Mr. Arga was a minor figure who had no right to give anything and didn't in the letter he brought. So they've now changed. Uh, I live opposite the British Museum, coincidentally, and I went there yesterday to see what the current cover story is. And it says, I quote, Lord Elwood acquired the sculptures in 1801, acquired is a useful all-purpose word, they don't say stole, and they don't say purchase. Um, the Ottoman Sultan grant, granted permission for Elgin to remove the sculptures from the Parthenon. That is a lie, a blank, blank lie, and it's dreadful that uh, museum officials who we expect would be scientific and honest would commit that to the millions of viewers every year. Uh, it goes on. Um, the scaffolding uh, was suffering damage at an alarming rate. Well, there's no evidence of that. It was damaged by the Venetians and the rubble was on the ground. Elgin appealed to Ottoman officials and was granted written permission, it says in brackets, Furman's, to recover, quote, any pieces of stones with inscriptions. 
That is an extract from the letter and does not reveal that the stones in question were the marble rubble that was on the ground. So there you have a level of deceit and dishonesty uh, from the British Museum in endeavoring to cover up by false information the story of Elgin's theft. Well, what do we do about it? And what from 80, Greece, uh, of course, obtained independence in 1833 and the, the, the Parthenon remain wouldn't have been injured in the Civil War, but without the sculptures stolen by Elgin. And the very first thing that Greece did was to ask for them back. And the king of Greece in 1836 begged to have them back. But no, the British Museum was adamant. They would not move. And there were diplomatic efforts for the next hundred years to get them back. But diplomacy uh, doesn't work and hasn't ever worked to get them back. We had uh, in we had the the whitening scandal in the 1930s, which uh, was covered up by the museum at the time, and of course in 1982. Well, actually, after the war, uh, the Foreign Office decided that morally they should go back and advise the government to as a way of thanking Greece for its support, the one country that had stood out against the Nazis in Europe, uh, to send them back. And preparations were made, and that seemed as though the moral right of Greece would prevail. And Melinda Mercury, of course, made that wonderful appeal in 1982 about them being the essence of greetings. <laughs> Melinda Mercury, I'm afraid, uh, was not liked by another towering woman of the times. Her name was Margaret Thatcher. She was prime minister and she directed the British government uh, to deny the request and to say, uh, it's not our business, it's all for the British Museum. And this too is a lie. It was a lie repeated by Boris Johnson a few months ago when he met the Greek Prime Minister and said bluntly, and it was published on the British government website, that it's not a matter for the British government, it is a matter for the British Museum. <laughs> what this deceptively hides is the British the Museum Act of 1963, which prohibits the British Museum from parting with any of its property. It's called a deaccession law, and it, it, it just prohibits any parting. When the British Museum a few years ago wanted to return some stolen, looted Nazi uh, pictures looted from Jewish people, um, the courts ruled you can't do it without parliamentary approval. So parliament was asked and did approve uh, a change to the law to permit looted Jewish property to be restored. And then the Australians discovered that they wanted a constitution. So they wanted their constitution back. It was held in a national institution and they had to change the law. So for Australians and for Jewish people, it's uh, parliament has made it possible, but not, I'm afraid, for um, the Greek nation. It will require the British government to change. Well, there's one great thing about Britain still, it does comply usually with international law. And it seems to me that the only way forward, because diplomacy will always fail. It's failed for 
200 years and it will fail again and again. But the only um, way forward is to bring, to have a case brought before the international courts. And I believe, and this is the thesis of my book, I'll conclude now with this, but uh, that international law has moved towards the principle that wrong cultural heritage wrongfully taken should be restored to the countries uh, from which it has been taken. And so uh, an advisory opinion can be requested by UNESCO, which is a pretty hopeless organization actually, but can be requested by the General Assembly. And the only diplomatic effort that will bring back the marbles is to have the General Assembly, which by and large supports restitution, to uh, require an advisory opinion from the International Court. And that Britain, at least I believe, will comply. Thank you. And Jeffrey, it's quite clear, you know, the importance of the work that you've done and its contribution, uh, not just to the repatriation of the Parthenon marbles, but the whole idea of, uh, of cultural appropriation is actually quite critical. I'll tell you one thing that I thought was quite striking because this, this is a story, uh, not just with, uh, uh, we'll call them criminals because I think we can call them criminals and criminal behavior, but this is not just about repatriation, but it's actually about reunification. What I found quite yeah. striking, you know, to your point, it would be like Michelangelo's David that's currently in Florence being cut up into bits and being in different countries and thinking that, you know, the Italians only had a certain part of it because the reality is, is that this is not just about what's right. Uh, it's about bringing back the integrity of that impressive work that was done on the Parthenon as, as a, a symbol of Hellenic culture and, and arts and engineering. I got a question for you. My question is, okay, you pretty well said the inappropriate and terrible things that were done by Lord Elgin. What happens if he had just, two, two scenarios, what happens if he had purchased them at that time in a proper fashion with the approval of the Ottoman government, or what, what would it mean in terms of repatriation if the Ottomans, as the occupiers of Greece, had decided to say, you know, we're occupying Greece, we're the occupying force, we're going to take these historical artifacts and we're going to bring them back to uh, parts, other parts of the Ottoman Empire. For those two scenarios, does it, does it matter how yeah, I think the, this is done? It's interesting. The first one... Uh, yes, Elgin would have had legitimate title if the Ottomans had sold it to him, but he never paid a penny. Right at the end, he had problems with his last shipment, and someone said, well, why don't you give the Athenians something? Oh, what right. do they want? They need a clock. So he sent them a clock, but they had to pay for the clock tower. <laughs> <laughs> and then the clock, which was German, didn't work. So that's the, that's the extent. As to moving it, I think that would have been a breach uh, of international law at the time because occupying powers were required to respect the cultural and religious monuments in the places where they occupied. So uh, I don't think that moving it would have altered the position. It would have made, of course, Elgin's theft less visible but it would still be uh, cultural despoliation. So here's, I'm gonna have one more question, then we're gonna move on because I'd like some of the participants to be able to submit questions. My, my last question is actually a very Canadian question. You know what, we have indigenous peoples in, in Canada. Many of their artifacts, are, I was in Berlin uh, later last year, and I could see artifacts from indigenous peoples in Canada from the Pacific Ocean, beautiful totem poles, uh, that are in German museums. Um, are there parallels to... Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm amazed that Canada hasn't... There's been nothing from Canada, Kenya, Australia, all these other colonized countries. Of course, they were looted by the British, and they're demanding their stuff back. 
And uh, the British Museum has nine million artifacts, but it only displays 90,000. And so it's stored. I mean, I, there must be thousands of indigenous Canadian uh, stuff that was taken in the early days, particularly of British occupation of Canada, uh, lying in the British Museum and in other museums. And there'll be headdresses and axes and arms and all kinds of things. Why don't you get them back? Now yeah. in the British, the Australian government is saying, give back the shield, the Guigo shield that Cook, when he arrived at Botany Bay, fired a couple of shots and said to have killed a guy holding a shield. And uh, it was taken back to the British Museum where it's exhibited. And of course it can't and won't give it back. But uh, the Kenyans are up in arms, the Jamaicans, and uh, a number, of course, the Chinese. You know what? <laughs> Lord Elgin's son, who was even worse than Elgin, led the British uh, in, during the Opium Wars to loot and kill uh, hundreds of people in the Beijing Summer Palace. And two million artifacts were, were stolen and uh, taken back to British and other museums. And so the Chinese have been very supportive of uh, the Greek government in this matter. Thanks. So I'm going to I'm going to ask uh, one of the new leaders of the Hellenic Initiative, Peter. Peter, if you could turn on your screen, I know you've got a question and then we'll uh, we'll get to questions from other folks. So, Peter, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nanos. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Nanos and uh, Mr. Robertson. Uh, Mr. Robertson, thank you so very much for your thoughtful and interesting presentation and work concerning the, the repatriation uh, for historical artifacts. My question is as follows, uh, Mr. Robertson, given your thesis and presentation from an um, environmental perspective, how does the layout of the New Acropolis Museum assist in the preservation of the Parthenon marbles and associated artifacts? And how does this assist to provide insight into the, into the conditions uh, arranged in the museum, the, the New Acropolis Museum for the proper display and maintenance of the marbles in Athens? Thank you. I, I think it assists enormously because you know, before the only good argument that the British Museum was if we send them back, they're going to be uh, subject to environmental damage from all the smog and the traffic fumes of Athens that would rise up. So uh, the new Acropolis Museum, which is itself a marvel of architecture, it's a, a, an amazing building, and on the top floor, dedicated to the marbles and the reunification, you not only can see them, but you look up and there through the ceiling, which is of glass, you see the Acropolis, you see the Parthenon, and you see usually a blue attic sky. And that's, that's where they belong. So I don't think anyone uh, who actually visits both galleries, <laughs> rather the grey and uh, North London gallery of the Duveen uh, fraudster, um, can compare. I mean, the marbles belong beneath the Parthenon rather than on top of it, and uh, but that's where they started, that's where they should end. And I think that's the great argument about, because you can I've drafted a draft convention for the return of wrongly taken property. And of course, you don't send back to museums which countries that are corrupt or museums where they're unsafe and can't be cared for. But um, if you have as your principle, the one that is becoming uh, accepted that wrongfully taken property, property should be restored. This is simply the best place for the world to appreciate these, this, this treasure of the ancient world. You've got to see it together. And to suggest that the glory of Greece, of liberty, 
democracy and peace should be <laughs> seen in the <laughs> Derby North London rather than on the third floor of this fine piece of architecture with the attic sky above is just ridiculous. Yep. Thanks, thanks, Peter, for your question. You know, Thank Jeffrey, you. there's uh, coming off some of your comments about some of the other items. There's one of the questions from the from the audience. Are there currently any steps for Greece and perhaps other countries whose antiquities are also in the British Museum to band together to return not just the marbles, but other antiquities? Can we create a popular front in order <laughs> to move this forward? Well, this is what I why I wrote my book, because we owe it to President Macron, who said in 2018, he went to Africa, French Africa and made a famous speech where he said that the cultural heritage of Africa should not be confined to European museums. And the French are returning, particularly the Benin bronzes, the, the British army wickedly in 1897 attacked the marvelous city of Benin, killed a lot of their inhabitants and looted the temples and took everything they could, including several thousand uh, Benin bronzes, extraordinary bronze figures that were sold. Uh, about 900 uh, kept in the British Museum and the rest sold to other European museums. And the France has returned its uh, to, to a new museum in Nigeria. So uh, Jamaica, Kenya, Australia, as I say, are demanding return. And this is, uh, I think the Parthenon marbles will always be the textbook case. And uh, the Greek government put a motion in the General Assembly uh, in the end, just before the pandemic. And uh, 104 countries supported it on the restitution of stolen property. So I think that is the way forward. I know Mr. Mitsotakis has more than any other Greek prime minister been concerned to been concerned to uh, effect the restoration, and I know he'll continue. But uh, that is, I think, the way forward to uh, get the International Court of Justice to say that international law has now developed to the stage we can say that it is a breach to retain uh, property of high cultural heritage, and the marbles being the highest, uh, that was wrongly taken in colonial times. You know, Jeffrey, to your point, I think we maybe our objective should make this a test case of justice and yes. uh, kind of restoring the integrity of, of that amazing artifact, which is a symbolism of uh, Hellenic culture and Western Western culture. Yeah, it is a matter of justice. Yeah. I mean, this is what uh, yeah. Cicero said in the famous case where he, he condemned Verres. It is a matter of justice that yeah. you don't deprive a people of their property. And as Macron has said, you don't deprive the young people of seeing and being inspired by the work of predecessors. Absolutely. You know, and I think we could probably talk all day long about this, and I'm sure all of the people that are viewing this webinar uh, agree, but I'm going to have to thank you because we're getting close to the, to the top of the hour. Um, your book is a tour de force. I just like to say that. It's must read for anybody that cares anything about arts, culture, justice, Hellenism, the Parthenon marbles, and uh, I bought your book. I just like to say, Jeffrey, I hope to see you in person someday, and then I can yes, get you to sign the book. And I'd suggest for anyone else that's interested in the book, Who Owns History, to go to Amazon and to order it. It's in English uh, and Greek. I feel, and this will be my last comment as a thank you to you, Jeffrey, before I pass it on to the final close. I feel I have been a witness to history. I feel like I, because of the thoroughness of your research, it's like sitting with a friend and them bearing witness to an injustice and wanting something to happen. So on behalf of everyone, 
Thank you. And I'm going to now throw it over to uh, Stephen Macrinos, uh, the Hellenic Initiative of Canada Director, to uh, wrap things up. So over to you, Stephen. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to start by thanking you all, uh, Jeffrey, Nick, for your excellent thought-provoking talk and all the participants for being here and your valuable input. I believe everyone here shares the same sentiment that we all hope we will be able to one day visit the Parthenon marbles in the Acropolis Museum, their rightful home. Having recently joined the board of the Hellenic Initiative Canada and worked with the new leaders, I'm happy to be amongst peers that share the same vision to unite Greeks, fell Hellens everywhere, to join forces to overcome any challenges brought forth in any recent past, and to lay down a solid foundation for a better future. The Hellenic Initiative started as an organization that wanted to provide hope for people put in vulnerable conditions with little support, but has grown to become so much more. We come together in times of crisis, but most importantly, to contribute to something bigger than us that unites us, challenges us to become better, and moves us to create a society we envision. I wanted to invite you all here today to consider joining us on this journey. Going forward, you can contact me or anyone here at the THI Canada to connect and find out more about how you can become more involved. I also wanted to mention that in the response to the recent tragic events that are unfolding, the Hellenic Initiative Canada is working with doctors um, of the world in Greece to welcome and provide humanitarian relief to Ukrainian families that are crossing the Greek borders. If you'd like to contribute to these efforts, we invite you to donate to our fundraiser, which can be found on our website, thehelleninitiative.ca. It's been a pleasure being with you all here today, and thank you so much for your time.